This podcast contains explicit content and is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Don't say we didn't warn you. Hello, my name is Madison. And I'm Hannah. And you are listening or watching uh, Who's Knocking? A true crime podcast. Yeah. I feel like the intro is always really weird and I feel really awkward doing it, but that's fine, I guess. Okay, so we're going to start. So today we're doing part two of the Todd Kolhep story. Um, and yeah, I think we'll probably just get right into it unless there's anything we want to talk about. Yeah, let's get into it. I mean, I, Madison, I really want to know what he did with people's feet. I, what was he doing with them? I'm so sorry. I have no idea. I have looked. I just don't get it. Spent many hours reading Reddit. <laughs> I've really, really tried, but it doesn't, first of all, it doesn't seem like too many people are interested. Like there's nobody trying to figure out that I could find why the feet are missing um to know and he has not said and he's denied that he removed the feet and the feet weren't found right Uh, no i don't think they ever found the feet okay what happened to them i need to know if anybody knows (laughs) well after after i finish this episode you feel free to go look into it if you can find it then like you're better at reddit than me which i think you are better at reddit than me um we'll see Okay, how about this? If we ever make merch, which I would really like to, just because I'd like it, if anybody ever finds out definitively who or why he removed the feet, we will send you a free merch item if we ever make merch. You will have earned it. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) because I also would really like to know. It's really bothering me. But anyway, there's lots more to discuss, so... Let's okay. okay. Because you were so nice and you did recaps, I will do a recap so that <laughs> I look like as nice of a person as you. I don't know. So let us know if you guys like the recap or if it's unnecessary. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anyway, here, here's my recap. So okay, last episode, we learned first about the quadruple homicide that took place in Chesney, South Carolina at the Superbike yep. Motorsport Shop. Victims were shop owner Scott Ponder, his best friend and store manager, Brian Lucas, their new mechanic, Chris Sherbert, and the bookkeeper and Scott's mom, Beverly Guy. The murders took place in 2003 and remained unsolved until investigators became aware of Todd Kolhep. So they found Todd Kolhep after Kayla Brown and her boyfriend, Charles Carver, went missing. The police were led to Todd's property based on the last signal that was traced from Kayla's phone. On the property, they found Kayla chained up inside a shipping container where she had been held hostage, raped and sexually assaulted for 65 days. Police also found the bodies of Charles Carver, Megan Coxie and Johnny Coxie buried on the property. All victims were missing their feet. It appeared that they feet. Why? had been twisted off, not cut off, and not chewed by animals. We also talked about uh, Todd's childhood, the rape he committed at age 15, his incarceration for 14 years, and then what he was up to when he got out. So Todd, at the time of his capture, was a real estate agent, a very successful real estate agent, who owned his own real estate company that was doing very well. And he also, he was also, um, he had his pilot's license and was like flying planes. Okay. Just, yeah, he was like living it up. pretty cool. And a lot of people knew him in the community. So where we are in the story now is that Todd has been apprehended. He's at the police station and uh, there's clearly piles of evidence, including an eyewitness to the murders. So Todd makes a deal with the police where he would admit to four other murders if they took the death penalty off the table. And this would also spare, this would work out really well because it would spare the victims having to go through a lengthy trial and sure. everyone would get closure from the superbike murders. Um, is the death penalty like a pretty common thing there? I don't know. Like, it seems to me that like Texas and Florida are like the, but I think Texas and Florida are, are are also like just bigger states with more people. So I don't I I think it's a thing there. Um, I don't know how like crazy the death penalty is there, but 
they, yeah. they were it, telling him that they were going right, to it was an option for sure because isn't it something where like a lot of people get the death penalty but then they don't actually execute them like they're just chilling um it takes a long time to execute people because generally if you get a death penalty and i'm not like super well versed in all this but to my knowledge if you get a if you or get a death penalty if you're on mm-hmm. death row then you have the option to appeal a number of times and so there's a lot of ways that you can appeal a sentence so it takes a long time in order to exhaust all the appeals and only after generally if you're on death row you exhaust every single appeal you can and the, only then will they give you will they actually execute you because you have a right what to about that. somebody like the people like john wayne gacy like they did that happen to him too or like in my mind, they executed him like right away. But no, did he ha- do have any appeals? I have no idea. It it all depends on the on the appeals process. Because okay. um, some people like accept their death penalty case and then don't appeal, and then they get executed. yeah. That might have been what happened. Um, I don't remember honestly. A lot of the like uh, big serial killers, like I. I don't want to say I was really into them, but like I was looked like researched in detail their cases a very long time ago. So I don't remember like the sentencing and stuff. Um, yeah, I don't remember. I just know he got the death penalty and I, I remember. Yeah, and so did Ted Bundy. Like that, and I don't remember yeah. him being on death row for a super long time, I think. Exactly. Which is weird because you'd think that he would have appeals because he was such a narcissist and like literally defended himself. Um, <laughs> yeah. Shut up, Paul. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the length of time generally correlates with the appeals process, but Got also um, like, I don't know what goes into creating a um, execution date. I think that might also take a little while in and of itself for whatever reason, like you have to gather enough people who like are down to be involved in killing somebody. And that's kind of difficult. And I think also, I don't know if I'm correct about this, but I remember listening to something a really long time ago about just getting the um, the actual like medications or whatever that they inject you with. They're not like the easiest thing to get a hold of. So I don't know if there's like, an extra process around that or whatever. Yeah. So it's not like there's like tons of people being executed in America. Um, I mean relative like every day (laughs) yeah no not I wouldn't say it's every day but relative other places like it's that's it's a very relative term you know that's Um, true it's interesting to look into yeah we do not have that here no life with parole after 25 years is the highest sentence and then maybe you get a dangerous offenders designation but you still get to apply for parole yeah so yeah super different and really aggressive but uh i don't know it's maybe fair in some cases yeah like there's and i think it's hard i generally am like i don't think the death penalty is a good idea there's been too many people that are innocent that have been executed and that's like the most horrific thing in the world but then there are people where it's like we have very definitively figured out that you like chris watts i'd be happy to see him go (laughs) (laughs) you know like there's yeah, a, it was like absolutely it. him he there's no question that he right. did it yeah and like he like he fucking murdered his children and pregnant wife yeah he's really bad see a bitch anyway back to the case at hand okay interesting side note um okay so he makes a deal with the police he admit to the four murders and they took the death penalty off the table. This would also spare the victims of having to go through a lengthy trial. So I think where the... That's good. I It is my guess that where they... I don't know if, if Todd just volunteered this information, but if we recall, there was a video that I didn't show you, but I told you about of Kayla riding in the ambulance, coming away from the um, scene of the crime or where she was Todd's property. And during that, she says... That like she says that he told her that he committed a crime or he committed four murders at a bike yes. shop and never he was never caught for that. So yeah. I, they know that he told her that. Okay. So then during this police interrogation, Todd makes an official verbal confession to the superbike murders. And one of the officers wrote it down word for word. And his version of the events goes like this. 
it loosely goes like this. And I'm leaving out a lot of details. I'm just giving you the Reader's Digest here. Cool. So sometime in 2003, Todd purchased a motorcycle from the Superbike shop. And after taking it home and trying it out, he realized that the bike was a little bit too advanced for him. And he thought maybe it wasn't the best idea for him to have it. And he wanted to return it to see if he could trade it in. Or do you want to either return it or see if he could trade it in for something smaller? Okay. Todd claimed that he then went back to the shop and the guys who I believe he is referring to Scott and Brian, Mm -hmm. maybe Chris, but I think probably in most part, uh, Scott, Scott and Brian. He said that the guys were pretty rude to him and made fun of him for his, quote, inability to ride that type of bike, end quote. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. Like, apparently, he he claimed that they were just openly, like, super big. They definitely him. didn't. Like, there's for, like, no way. He definitely no just. Yeah. That's yeah. too funny. He oh, says God. that they discussed coming by with a trailer when he made up his mind about whether or not he wanted to return the bike. And then he says that two or three days later, the bike was stolen. And he hmm. also noted that the guys at the super bike shop knew where he was storing it because they had delivered the bike to him. So he's implying that he doesn't come out and say it outright, but he's implying that they stole the bike. Okay. So then Todd said he made a police report and the officer taking the report also happened to be super rude to him and joked about the mm. bike being stolen and said that it almost he- seems like Todd is a super nice guy and everybody else is terrible. Yeah, well, yeah, everybody that he runs into is like a huge dick to him. But he's uh, so nice. I know. He makes so, sense. He's such a cool guy. So I don't know why all these people <laughs> are being so crazy. Um, he, he, he says that the officer was like, I didn't even have a chance to issue you a ticket. Like, just like out of nowhere, the officer was a total dick. So then Todd mentions that he's started taking classes and going to school. And then he decided that he wanted to get another bike. So he okay. went on down to the super bike shop again and was trying out different bikes. And like, if they were so terrible, why'd you go back? Yeah. And like, he doesn't, he doesn't say anything about like talking to them about it or like, you know, uh, like arguing with them or being like, you guys stole my bike, even though he's like pretty sure they stole his bike. He said he was there and the guys were really rude to him again. Essentially, mm. they were joking about his bike being halfway to Florida by then, implying that A, they stole the bike and B, they were making fun of him about stealing the bike to his face. No mention that he like had any sort of back and forth about it, but he was just purely the victim of their bullying. Oh, for sure. So then he left and he came back on November 6th at a not busy hour to somewhere around 2, 2.30 during the middle of the day. And he was sitting on one of the bikes waiting for all the customers, oh shit, waiting for um, some of the other customers in the shop to leave. And Mm -hmm. then he also waited for one of the guys who wasn't there to come back in. I believe he meant Brian. And then he began to very systematically shoot all four bike shop employees. He also claimed that he didn't want to hit Beverly because he, quote, doesn't like to shoot women and will never shoot a kid, end quote. Thanks. So really good guy, clearly. Um, Todd then gave a pretty detailed description of how he very methodically shot each of the four victims, where he shot them, and with um, approximately the amount of shot he shots he discharged for each person, what bullets he shot, and where in the shop he hit them. He had okay. two types of bullets that day, which he identified, which were used, and he identifies which ones were used on who he had some that were, I think they were brass and nickel or whatever, like the metal that they were made out of. So Mm -hmm. it was like very clear where those shots were. Um, and like he had used, like at one point he switched his magazine, I think it's called the, the like bullet. I have no idea. We don't know anything anything you're saying. Nothing makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever. Well, whatever. Um, I mean, it makes sense. I just don't know. Yeah, or maybe it does. Maybe it does. He's like clearly super into guns because he's like, yeah, his well, and his dad was into, into weapons. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think it's interesting. Like, I'm sure it's a hobby with a lot of aspects to it, but for sure. Just don't um, use it for murdering people. <laughs> yeah, that's where it's like not cool. My dog um, is making a nest right now. Sounds cozy. I'm not cozy. <laughs> Neither. <laughs> anyway. Um, blah, blah, blah. So through the whole interview, Todd is super relaxed. He has no problem talking about the violent acts that he claims to have committed. And he makes 
many really weird side comments. Like he's, it just, he's a really weird guy and I'll show you some footage, but, mm. um, and mainly this is kind of the stuff that's in the footage, but like, um, somewhere in the beginning, he, he says that the bike shop actually gave him a t-shirt, which he still owns, but you know, he's not okay. the type to keep trophies. Um, and when he talked about not wanting to shoot Beverly because he didn't like to shoot women and children. And then he starts talking about a letter that Kayla wrote about when Todd, uh, sorry. Okay. So basically, and I, I think I'll get to this a little bit later, but when he had Kayla locked up, he gave her paper and pe- and a pen and was like, you can like write shit down if you want. Um, and like, he like okay. read it all. And um, he like out of nowhere is like, yeah, Kayla said that when she wrote down this letter, she was like, I, I'm so lucky that like I got, I was abducted by a killer with a conscience. Because, like, she wrote I, that? Yeah. Um, but like she wrote it while she was held captive. So like. And also like, that's not like, you're still a murderer that yeah. doesn't. And we'll get more into that later because there's more interesting stuff about that. But for the purposes okay. of now, it's just like whatever. And then he compares his murder spree to a video game and talks about how, um, like all his skills with a gun and like the types of guns he used and that he wore, like, he's like, Oh, do you want to know why there were no fingerprints? It's because I wore two pairs of gloves. And I always do that when handling ammo. And that's why there's no fingerprints on the door. Cause I use my knuckles to go oh, through God. the door. Like he just, he's like showing off to the police yeah. officers. So I'll get you to watch that video now. It's just a couple Kay. pieces of the interrogation and then we can talk more about it. Okay. Yes. And that's on Parisburg Road, correct? I still got the t-shirt. They give you a t-shirt? They did. I kept it. I'm not a trophy guy. You're not a trophy guy? Mm-hmm. They wanted to give you a trophy? No, sir, that was oh. actually... I gotcha. <laughs> and doing my best to make sure that the pain customers were not there. Collateral damage is mm-hmm. not cool. <laughs> kind of funny. Kayla put on her paperwork when she was writing stuff out to me that she found a killer with a conscience and a kidnapper with morals. Whatever the hell that meant. You remember that? Yeah. I actually wasn't meaning to hit the mom. You actually what? I was not meaning to hit the mom. I prefer not to shoot women if I can. I'm going to refuse to shoot a kid. Okay. Tell me what happened then. Uh, finally, all four showed up. From the sound, it sounded like there was nobody else there. Oh, all four showed up. Uh, when you say all four? All four people who worked at the, at, at the bike store. The mechanic, the mom. I was not going for the mom, but she was there at the time, and she was working there, but she got thrown into it. She wasn't a, <coughs> she wasn't a primary target. I was sitting on a black Kawasaki Katana, 600, I believe. It's a crap bike. Any of this? I don't remember hearing any of that. I, I will tell you that once I engaged, I was engaged. Okay. Um, so it's like, at that point, it's almost like a video game. It's not a game, but it's almost like you... You're focused on, you've been there, sir. You know what I'm talking about. It must be so just like uncomfortable Did you finish? Him. Did you finish watching it? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> when he's like, you've been there. You know You know what I'm talking about. And the guy's like, no, bro. <laughs> yeah. No. So it's. I don't so know what you're talking about. I think oftentimes the interrogators go in there like okay well let's get we're gonna be friends with this guy we're gonna be super nice to him and like right. play along with his hey. stuff or whatever and i think that these guys like they're super nice to him and like the odd time they'll like laugh at something he says or go along with it but for the most part they're nice to him but they don't like he like in, in that part he's like like you guys know what i mean and they're both just like they don't even reply and that happens so many times where he's like you know i did this blah 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 and they're like cool bro um but I find it so interesting because on the one hand, at every chance he gets in this interrogation, he's emphasizing his 
alleged morals and his conscience and like he's like I wouldn't I wouldn't I don't like shooting women and I would never shoot children and I didn't want to like have collateral damage with people who are just paying customers and you know Kayla said I have a conscience and blah 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 Mm -hmm. where it's like and on the other hand he's also trying to really play up what an effective killer he is and like how good he is at using guns and how like there's a part where he's like I, I what is it he's like I create, I make like zero spray. Like he's basically saying like, he's so, uh, he's such a good shooter that like, there's almost no like blood splatter that comes out, which is like, dude, like you're talking about about that fucking killing people. Yeah. And also trying you're so you, like, he can't have both. And like, he literally doesn't yeah. understand that he doesn't understand that. Like he can't be like, I'm like the best murderer you've ever met, but also I'm a good person. Like those yeah. don't go together, which I think just really like he he has no idea how to get people to like him. Yeah, it really showcases just like how un like he's no clue like how people are like yeah, he's like how to has, socialize. He has no empathy. He's no knowledge of like what it is like to be a person with like feelings right. and actual morals. I but imagine also, it's at least some something to do with like his upbringing and a learned behavior because for sure you know sounds like his mom really enabled everything with him and and basically excused him of ever having to care if he did damage to others yeah yeah for sure but also like he he like makes up his own reality he like makes up that like the he makes up that he is a like moral person and that he yeah. is a good person well, he probably wants to be seen as that which is so weird because he also wants to be seen as like a really good serial killer yeah but anyway i just it's it's such an interesting interrogation if anyone else is interested they're uh on youtube um and yeah the officers like they don't pretend to be impressed by Todd. They like nearly do, but don't like, I think they give him just enough that like he'll keep he'll talking, keep talk. yeah. but they're not like, you know, being that nice to him where they're like, yeah, man, that's so cool. Like <laughs> you killed all these yeah. people. So then after he confessed to the super bike killings, Todd was also allowed to call his mother, give her a photograph and then transfer money to a friend's child's college fund. And this is like, stuff that he got in exchange for his cooperation. Got it. And so during the phone call to his mom, she is like obviously super upset and he's telling her what he did. And she asked, she's like, I bet she wasn't surprised. (laughs) Well, first she's like, I'm like in a lot of trouble, whatever. And then she asked him if he killed people and Todd said yes. And then she asked the fact that that's the first thing she asks is like, (sighs) yeah, well, I think she also probably at this point knew about him holding the girl on the property and like the other people that he killed like that had already been established but then um she's like she asked how many and he says quote you don't have enough fingers end quote so and i think a lot of people in, take from this that like there's more than the now well, how many fingers does she have <laughs> the now s- seven people that he's admitted to killing yeah um so then on May 26, 2017, Scott pleaded guilty to seven counts of murder, two counts of kidnapping, and one count of criminal sexual assault. He was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. And Todd is currently imprisoned in the Broad River Correctional Institution. After all of this is said and done, and, and Todd is sentenced and in prison, there's a lot of speculation conspiracies things that come up that um are interesting tidbits to the story so first of all i talked last episode about a documentary that i watched um Mm -hmm. it's called the devil unchained and it's basically done by this um reporter from minnesota named maria always Mm-hmm. and she kind of goes through everything and I use a lot of it as a source. I think she does a pretty good job at like explaining what happened and stuff. Um, but if I refer to Maria, that's who I'm talking about. Okay. Um, so, but the first thing I want to talk about is 
there is a lot of, well, I hesitate to say a lot, but at least one woman who's really adamant that Todd did not commit the superbike murders. Really? So Pat Brown is a criminal profiler. She's like also an author and a commentator and lots of things like really out there as a criminal profiler. And she thinks that Todd's confession to the superbike murders was a false confession. Mm. And I'm going to go through like why she thinks that and all this stuff. And I don't think she sounds cool, by the way. She is. She's a little. She's a lot. She's a lot of person, which Hmm. I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. Yeah, I Um, like that. Yeah, I think you'd like her. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But I I can't find a lot of people who agree with her. But she okay. she claims that this is all like a big grand conspiracy. Um, mm. So she thinks that first. Of, so first of all, she was actually hired by the sheriff and the detectives to create a criminal profile. And so she says that they hired her and she spent about 50 hours, so like five days of work going through every piece of evidence to create a profile and such and such and such. And then like she stopped working for them. Um and John Douglas also created a profile. He's the one that I talked about earlier when I talked about the, his profile and it really did match, seemed to match Todd and whatever. She claims that he did not have, like he didn't go to the crime scene. He didn't look at all the evidence. He basically like talked to the um, investigators and created a profile based on like their, um, like what they told him. I don't know how much of that is true, but that's her claim. Okay. And John Douglas, I don't know if I mentioned before, but he's like- the guy who Mindhunter is based off of, he's the one who like basically created criminal profiling um, and like was involved in the Atlanta child murders and many other murders since. And he was heavily involved in the documentary that I was talking about. Um, And he's coming out with a book actually, where he like talks about the Todd Kolhap case. So to him, he seems to be way more involved than she's giving him credit for. Um, Okay. So I don't know. And also, I don't have any answers to this. I'm just going to say what she she says. um, What do you think? Like, or tell me. I I really don't know, but I'll say at the end. Okay. Um, I think she's she's got a lot of really good points, um, but also some that are like less good. Okay. So she claims, and I think this is a good point that first of all, him confessing was actually like a it was a good deal for him and for the sheriff because mm-hmm. the sheriff was up for re-election. He's in a, it's an elected position. And okay. so having finally closing the superbike case would have been huge for him and would have been yeah. really important for his re-election, which was coming up. Mm-hmm. Second of all, Todd giving them more confessions and more information after it was very clear that he was going to get, like that this would have been a death penalty case kept him from getting a death penalty and really didn't add much to his sentence. He was already getting a life sentence. So it like cost him nothing to, it actually like was better than nothing. It was a gain for him to confess to all of this. That's so interesting. You know, kind of side note, I wonder, so like some people would want the death penalty. Like some people would rather not have to suffer in prison and also be known like as a murderer but he wants to stay alive yeah, like he and I think that um I don't know I think that like staying alive versus being dead like even if it's in a shitty even if it's in prison I think a lot of people would probably rather still be alive yeah. and like there's always the possibility that you could get out for whatever reason right um Plus, if you're any sort of like narcissist, you, I think, ha- and I don't know if Todd is a narcissist, but I think he's like a, the type of personality that he's like, doesn't have um, like a, he doesn't have remorse and he doesn't have like a firm grasp on reality. Like yeah, he I'd makes say. up his own reality. So yeah. um, I think like it very easily in his mind, he could be like, oh, this is not going to be forever. Or like some people also just thrive in prison. Like it this especially people who like lack morals and like are good with the like prison hierarchy um you know some people i wouldn't say enjoy but like just they do well 
Um, but anyway, uh, so Pat really believes the sheriff, the police, and the media colluded to create this, to, to like say that Todd committed these murders, even though everybody knows that he didn't. Interesting. So the sheriff, uh, Chuck Wright, as I said, was running for office and he wanted to put this whole thing to bed for his reelection. And then um, I already talked about John Douglas. She like shit all over his profile and says that he didn't spend any time before he made that profile. I don't know if that's true. It could be true. But then I think since then, he spent a lot of time on the case after um but he does stick by his profile and his profile okay. it, like if todd was the killer his profile was like 100 percent correct okay and i think for her like she made this profile that was not correct if it was todd so like it's possible that she wants to like stand by her profile and not admit that it was wrong that's like i think the like competing theory against that right um so then she says that Chuck, the sheriff, lied about her involvement in the case. And she says that he that she just like made up this profile out of nowhere. Like she he said on, in the media that she had nothing to do with it when she was, in fact, hired by them. And like I told you, went through the evidence for like 50 hours, developed a profile, blah, blah, blah. Like she was hired by them to do that. So then she made him like apologize because she's like you. That's like defamatory. You can't say that you didn't hire me when you hired me. And it seems like that went her way. Um, so then the police said to the media and to the families of the victims on 48 Hours Mystery that they knew Todd was the killer because he told them that he shot each of the victims in the forehead. And that was something that only the killer would know. So that was mm-hmm. their justification for like being like, we know that he did it. Right. When in fact, this is a lie. The vi- None oh. of the victims were shot in the forehead. It's one or t- I don't remember where exactly each one was shot but i think um there were body shots there were back of the head shots there were god like this was it was not like that at all but i also believe that in his confession todd doesn't say that that he shot each one of them in the forehead like i don't know Mm. that just like came up and was just like a lie created out of thin air and you can look at the autopsy reports none of them were shot in the forehead Then she also finds it super weird that Todd was both a serial killer and committed a mass murder. That's like not a common thing at all. Yeah. Um, She also talks about there's a lot of things Todd got wrong in his uh, in his uh, confession like mm. his series, he goes into extreme detail about exactly what happened. And like, there are times where he said, I think I shot one shot. It, uh, things I shot two shots. It was definitely two. Maybe it was three. Like he's very specific on what he's saying. And if there's something that he's uh, unsure of, he says it, but a lot right. of the stuff was just totally wrong. Interesting. Um, which had to, mostly has to do with the bullets. So I, as I said, there were two different types of bullets and like, judging on the crime scene they were able to decide like where which ones were shot first and blah 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 and he kind of says it all differently than what it was um now it does seem like it wasn't him like that's convincing and i think that a lot of a lot of his things that he said that were incorrect i think could reasonably be blamed on the fact that this murder happened in 2003 he's confessing to it in 2016 it's yeah. unlikely that you're going to remember things properly. And it's likely that you could remember things improperly and think that you remember them properly. Like we've talked about this a lot. That's true. Your own wit- like witnesses to a crime are often wrong about many details. So mm-hmm. I think that's like the most charitable way to look at that and the way that the uh, sheriff and the police have played it off. Um, but that's not yeah. the only thing. So I think either is possible, but um the fact that he like the serial killer mass murder that doesn't make sense together like that's not a common thing it's not um but like anything is possible there's a lot of things like people often most murders uh murder people like within their own race but then you have like jeffrey dahmer or israel keys who like don't 
fit that everything there are many rules that like statistically make sense but all rules are broken by somebody that's true so that's why it's just like i don't know so then there was allegedly like there was there was talk about somebody being in the so there, there's this person who's the, who is the last customer in the shop who has yeah. not been identified they the off-putting you know, one uh, no, the, the last customer talked about the off-putting person right? and they right, developed right. a sketch based off that person, but the last customer, like they, you know, that they're the last customer because they had, uh, their credit, they like put their credit card through at a specific time. And then like they're later seen driving away through a convenience store security camera. But that last person was the one who said they saw somebody sitting on a motorcycle. Um, and Then, so then Todd talked about how he was sitting on a motorcycle. I think there was, it was one of those clips. He was like, I was sitting on this motorcycle, it's blowed at whatever 600 piece of crap cycle. Um, And so he's included this tidbit that she thinks he could not have been that last person sitting on the motorcycle, um, but that the sheriff told him that somebody was sitting on the motorcycle. So to say that he was the person sitting on the motorcycle, if that makes sense. Yep. That I'm a little sketchy on, but that's how I perceived her to be talking about this. Like, like she's basically saying that he, that the sheriff's was, was trying to, was like told him to be the off-putting person. And that like, basically the person that the sketch was created, like to, to try to be that person in order to um, make it look like he did it. So then Pat Brown talks about the devil unchained documentary. She shits all over that too. She hates it. Um, (laughs) In the documentary, Maria Awas, who's the like main girl doing it, she has this guy named Gary Garrett, who knew Todd before all of the murders. He had started working for him at his real estate company. And so now that Todd is in prison, Gary is has become his biographer. So he's been talking with him and he gets a lot of information and like evidence files and whatever. And he helps Maria get in touch with Todd. Um, but in the documentary, like halfway through, so they're, they're going along and it's like, yeah, he did the super bike murders or whatever. And then she starts talking with Gary about how he was talking with Todd and like independently he came up with, he's like, now I'm actually like 50% sure that um, Todd committed the murders because all these things don't make sense. They talk about the bullets he, that like he admitted to the bullets being in the forehead and that it wasn't like that and blah, blah, blah. And so they're like, that's really sketchy. But then they kind of like get over it and they talk to the sheriff and the sheriff was like, he mainly got everything right with the stuff he didn't get right. You know, it was 13 years ago. How's he going to remember that? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So Pat is like pretty pissed off because she basically says that like, they just took her work and said that it was theirs. They're like, she's like, there's no way they could have been like researching this case and not seen. She's made like 10 blog posts about this. And she's basically been shouting to anybody who will listen that he, this, like that she doesn't think that he did the super bike murders. So she's like super pissed and thinks that they just took credit for her theory and then kind of like just let it go and made it seem like that was not like her theory is doesn't have any merit um which kind of seems like they did i don't know yeah um and i think her theory does have merit it definitely has some merit for sure um like i would believe that he did it but i'd also believe that he didn't (coughs) i have one thing that i can't get away from and that i'll tell you about at the end okay so she also talks about Noel Lee. I talked about, I may have talked about Noel Lee. He was the person to find everybody. Um, he was the friend who called up beforehand, said he was going to come hang out. And then sh- by the time he showed up seven minutes later, he found everybody dead. So she claims that his story changed. That first he said, I called the business, spoke to Beverly, and she said that there were some tickets to an event. So he hopped in his car and drove down. Then he changed his story and said that he called Beverly, heard about the tickets to this event. I don't know what the event is, but it was an event. Um, Then he took a shower after the call and then made his way down, which like gave a little bit more room between the time that he took, uh, took the call or had the call with Beverly and then got to the scene of the crime. Right. 
Then he says that when he was there, he was on his cell phone with his girlfriend when he found the bodies, that he told his girlfriend about what he was seeing. He told her he was going to go across the street to another house to call the police. And the girlfriend said that that would be suspicious. So to go into the bike shop and use that phone. Entering a crime scene where he didn't know whether or not the assailant was still there. This is weird for many reasons. One, he's on his cell phone. Why not just call the police on his cell phone? I don't know why that was not an option. And Pat's like, why was that not an option? Second of all, if you don't know that there's a fucking killer still in there, why would you go in walking over bodies to use the phone in a crime scene? Like, how is it? I don't know how that would be suspicious. Yeah. Um, No tickets were ever found that he was talking about. The girlfriend was not talked to, to confirm the story. Um, And apparently he did go to this event with his son the next day. Um, Hmm. So then also the number one most suspicious thing about Noel is that in the 911 call, so he calls and he's talking to the police and they're like, what happened? What happened? He's like, it looks like everyone's been shot. Everyone's on the ground. Um, He goes, the owner's been shot, his mom has been shot, and the mechanic's been shot. And so far, uh, so far, I see three, but I'm scared to go in the back. Now, the issue with this statement is that Chris Sherbert is the mechanic, and he was mm-hmm. shot dead, but he was shot in the back. Everyone else is in the front. So Noel's on the phone saying that he knows that Scott and his mother are shot, and he knows the mechanic is dead, but he has not gone to the back because he's too scared. But the mechanic is shot dead in the back. So if he had not gone to the back, he would not know that the mechanic was shot. Yeah. The other guy who was in the front is Brian and he's the manager and he knows these people well. So either he's lying and he did commit the murder. Thus he knows Chris, the mechanic is dead in the back or he just messed up. And it was just, he accidentally said that. What do you think it was? I have no idea. Allegedly, Pat claims that she heard that they were like all three of them, Brian, Scott and Noel Lee had some sort of disagreement or they were in some sort of fight or whatever. And that there was like issues between them. She just kind of pulls this out of her ass. I don't there's no evidence for this that I'm aware of. Um, and. On top of that, there's no evidence whatsoever that Todd was in the shop the day of the murders. There's no DNA evidence. Nobody saw him there, even though he claims that he was there waiting around, waiting for people to leave with people seeing his face and his car was parked right outside. Nobody mentioned the car. Nobody else mentioned seeing him. And he's a pretty like popular person in the community he's a realtor so like which is fucked a lot of people probably know him it's a very small town right so that is those are her main claims i I think like she has a lot but those are the main ones okay um i think some of them i think this whole phone call and him saying that he that the mechanic is shot dead when he's not seeing the mechanic and is also claiming that he has not been to the back where the mechanic is shot dead that's i think pretty damning and it just to me is like you guys should have looked into this guy way more Um, why would you not look into him more um but the one thing that i can't get over that makes it look like todd did do it is that on the way in the ambulance from the where she was held captive kayla talks about how todd told her that he committed these murders that's true That was before there was any sort of deal to be made. That was when he held her captive. So either he told her that to scare her. I mean, it seems like he was lying about a lot of things and saying, I did this, I did that. Um, And then coincidentally, it all turned out that actually the police wanted him to, because like her, Pat Brown's theory is that the police, like that the sheriff specifically was like, you need to confess to this and I will not give you the death penalty. Like she thinks it was literally a conspiracy. And even that the media has been covering it up knowing that it's not true. So that's like a very, to me, grand conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Um, And it just, to me, something about him telling Kayla 
that he committed those murders beforehand doesn't really track with that whole conspiracy. Cause then that has to just be a coincidence that he said that to her to scare her knowing that was fake. And then it happened just so happened that they're like, we want you to confess to this. And like, he already mentioned that. Right. So that's where, that's like the one thing where I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it does seem like most people have like Pat Brown has been very loud about this. If you're looking into the case with any sort of vigor, you'll have seen her blogs. She's very vocal. So either a lot of people are ignoring her and like falling in line with this conspiracy Mm -hmm. or he did do it. Um, I think that him. Well, if he wore two pairs of gloves, like he said, there wouldn't be evidence, right? Yeah. I think I do think that this type of crime like tracks with his personality. Like, yeah, because it's so violent and just like sudden. And then it's it's kind of done he seems like he's very like if somebody is a dick to him like he'll be a huge dick back and i i think that it's possible that the guys either were like slightly dickish to him yeah i'm sure they were like or five percent dicks but he took it as like yeah or he basically like made up in his head that they were dicks to him yeah which could have maybe they reminded him of somebody who was a dick to him or they said something probably like super reasonable like do you know how to ride this bike or whatever and he's like how dare you i don't but like why would you say that like he just like you know again creating his own reality um but it does seem like the consensus the general consensus is that he did do it but i don't know pat does bring up some good points i think at the very minimum she brings up some points about other like look into this Noel guy because that was a really shady statement that he made yeah. on the 911 call. Just saying. Doesn't mean that he's guilty, but I don't know. I just, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. The needing a different phone to call the police when you're on the cell phone with the girlfriend. Doesn't and make sense. it also is just very convenient for Todd to have some murders to cough up to, to avoid the death penalty and the share like this is a 13 year old case that everybody's been dying to solve and that the police have made um mistakes on you know that whole thing with the uh the dna swap and whatever like they looked they looked like completely incompetent with that case so i'm sure everybody was just dying to solve it right that happens sometimes (laughs) so now there's a lot of other questions and theories about the case and about, so if we're taking as a given that Todd did do the superbike murders, that means that he did, he murdered, he did a, a, a mass murder on mm-hmm. in 2013. And then 13 years later or 12 years later with Megan and, and Johnny, then he, that's when he kills next. So that's a very right. long time between murders for somebody with such a quick temper and somebody who's like, you know, not as controlled of a person as Todd yep. is. The defense team was very adamant that these were all of Todd's murders, but Todd has said on multiple occasions, including to Maria, the filmmaker of the Devil Unchained documentary, that there were more victims. Mm-hmm. In the film... He's he's he talks to her and he's like, so she has like a lot of conversations with him, both on the phone and like through letters. And he says that everything that happened in the media, like 10 percent of it is true. Most of it is not true. And he has all these issues now with everything and like how he's been portrayed and everything. And so she's like, what do you mean? He's like, for one thing, quote, the body count is not even close to accurate, end quote. Then she asks, quote are you saying that it's more than seven end quote? And he replies, quote, considerably end quote. God. So, and as I said, like that's, it makes sense. Um, But it's very unclear. I'm going to go through what he's claims, but it's very unclear to me what he's lying about or what's true. Right. Cause he's very grandiose when he talks about himself. Um. So for one thing, according to Tom Clark, who's an ex Spartanburg investigator and who was interviewed for the documentary, Todd admitted to him that he was part of a 
they, he called it a hunt club in Mexico. Okay. And these were groups of people that would go down to Juarez, Mexico as a group, and they would just go shoot people. Um, Dear and God. Like basically it would drug dealers, essentially. Um, so it was like this. somebody would take them down and be like, okay, let's shoot all these drug dealers. And that, like, they would just yeah. kill a bunch of people. Todd told Tom that he would rent a plane uh, in the States. He would pay in cash and then he would circumnavigate all the way down to Mexico, um, which sounds, I don't know, kind of unrealistic. But Tom spoke to a pilot about this to see if it was possible. And the pilot told him that, yeah, it would. It would be possible. It would be very difficult to do, but it could be done. Okay. Maria also says that when she was corresponding with Todd, that he did mention Juarez to her, but didn't give any details. And apparently there was and possibly still is an open investigation on Todd Kolhep in Mexico. That's all we know about that. But he claims it to be true. And it would make sense because he could just go down and shoot a bunch of people. And like, that's how he would get his like murder thing that he liked to do done. Yeah. But also completely unverified. Right. Um. In the documentary, he also says to Maria or mentions um, that he had killed two guys in an apartment complex that he was living in. Oh. Um, yeah. And this was before the Superbike murders in 2001. He says that they had been bothering him because they knew that he was a registered sex offender. <laughs> um, they were harassing him and posting. That's flyers. a reason to murder them. Yeah. He hated them, but they sound like heroes to me. They were like posting flyers and telling everybody in the complex that they were living around a level three, most likely to reoffend sex offender. Mm -hmm. I'd want to know that personally. True. Um, I heard there's an app for it. Yeah, I think there's ways to find out. I, I'd like to know. I'd like to know if there was any registered sex offenders living in my building. Yeah. I feel like that'd be relevant information. Yes. <laughs> um. He gave a very detailed description of the event of the murder. Okay. He said that like it was nighttime and he stabbed them both in a parking lot, which is very interesting because all of his other murders are um, with a gun. Right. And in the, um, in the interrogation about the superbike murders, his confession, he says very plainly that he's never stabbed anyone. Huh. But now he's saying to Maria that he stabbed these two guys in the parking lot and he's so untrustworthy yes he's very so untrustworthy very, yeah. but then in certain ways he's kind of i don't know john douglas seems to think that he's like t like tells the truth his own version of the truth but like yeah. he believes what he says okay. um so he says that he stabbed them and that there was like a ton of blood so he like put them in his trunk and he poured water all over the blood to like, wash it away and then he he drove them until he found a little spot off the interstate. And he said there where it was, there was a road ends sign. And then he went past that sign into the woods and buried them in the woods. Maria brought this okay. information to the police and they were pretty skeptical, but they decided to look into it. She pretty much convinced them to. And okay. after Todd told her all of this, he's like, I'm not going to help you. I won't like go with you because like basically they're like okay well come show us where you buried the people and he's like no i won't do mm -hmm. that he said he would help if they granted him immunity and like took the death penalty off the table but since they wouldn't do that he said he wouldn't help so she looked into it and she found a couple spots that she thought might be the place and the police looked into it and they kind of agreed on a location that they would check um it was not Maria's top spot to look, but whatever she, they decided to look in the spot because the police thought it was the best place to look. Um, right. They brought a bunch of cadaver dogs and spent oh, a whole day up. searching. Yeah, they were cute. Um, but they did not find anything. And the police were like, okay, we did one search. That's it. We're not going to look any further. And so that is just unsolved. Um, 
And there was a big, in the documentary. Did they have record of like who those people were and were those people murdered? So she looked into at the time and place that it happened. Like, did two people go missing at all around this time and place? Could not find anybody to match those descriptions. Yeah. But she, and I think, see, in my most cynical reading of this, this was Mm -hmm. like the end of the documentary and like took up a lot of time. And I kind of feel like, like, all right, let's wrap pushing it to like create more film um which is definitely a possibility um but she's got john douglas with her he's he's like a pretty high profile guy and like he's got a really long career i don't know why he he is retired so me i don't know but i don't know why he would just go along with something like if he knew it was stupid you know what I mean? And he, she talks with him a lot and he's like, I think that when he says stuff, you, like he has no reason to lie at this point. Um, yeah. And that he, he thinks that he generally tells the truth. It's his own version of the truth, but like it is the truth. And I don't know how much I buy that. Um, I think he has tons of reason to lie and it's just like so that people will keep talking to him and yeah purely for attention like that's reason enough and he seems to love attention like he can't he can't figure out how to have like a real human relationship so yeah he doesn't exactly exactly attention is like the best he can hope for maria is like a like kind of youngish attractive woman like she's just like talking with him all the time like yeah that is reason enough to lie about any of this agreed um but John Douglas is very interested in Todd and he says that he he like sent him a big survey like that he sends to a lot of serial killers or whatever. I oh, love that. He didn't explain like what exactly it is, but, you know, just so asking him a bunch of though. questions. And she, he's like, literally nobody has ever given such detailed answers and answered as many questions as Todd did. Like he gave the most thorough um, answers on the survey. Right. So. I think that he just enjoys studying this guy because he's like kind of an open book in his own way. Yeah. Um, So yeah, that's another, there's like a bunch of possible murders that he did, but no evidence to prove that he did them. So then after everything was said and done, and another thing that Todd says that was portrayed incorrectly by the media, which he's not totally wrong about stuff about Kayla Brown Mm-hmm. So Kayla is the only living victim. And so as I get into this, just I think it's important to remember Todd is a serial killer and the liar and Kayla is a victim. And that's how I see things. So Todd says that, yes, Kayla is a victim, but he says that he never raped her. He says that she was a willing participant and that everything they did together was consensual. And he boldly claims that he has proof sure. of this. So he, and I explained a lot lot of this before, how he told her, like, he was like, he didn't make her do stuff when he sexually assaulted her. Like, if she said no, he would stop. But then he also made it very clear to her that he, if he didn't have a use for her, he would kill her. So that's his way of making himself think that he's not raping her or like his way so that Basically, what he's saying to him is the truth, that he didn't rape her. But we all know that he did. Um, but his, yeah, 100%. His, his proof of this is that, as I told you before, he gave her a pad of paper and a pen and told her to like write as like for something to do. And he says that she wrote him letters. And this is where the quote comes from, where she says, quote, it was just my luck that I got a killer with a conscience, a kidnapper with morals, end quote. And she did write this. And he says that she asked for more sex and that in her written letters to him, she asked for him to buy her very specific vibrators and stripper poles and all this shit. And um, besides the fact that he killed Charles, that Kayla actually really liked it out there and that it was all evident in her letters. Now, these letters do exist. Okay. The woman, Maria, who made the documentary, was able to look through them in their entirety, but she was not given permission to read direct quotes. But she says, reading through the letters, that it's Kayla starts off sounding very resigned and that they start to sound very angry. 
And then after she starts to really get into things with Todd and like say the things that he's making her say. And I think this completely makes sense. Um, yeah. For one thing, sh- this could absolutely be a survival mechanism, which yeah. is what led her to survive for 65 days after Megan lasted only 10 days or seven days, I think. Right. In the in one of the Dr. Phil interviews, Kayla says, quote, later on, I realized that I had to stay alive in order to be found. And I realized that it would be easier if he thought things were going his way. So I made him think whatever I had to to stay alive to keep him from abusing me, end quote. So Kayla learned I as, long as, by that. as long as she served her purpose, she would stay alive. So I think that's like yeah. we that's very obvious that yeah. that's how that worked. Now, there's one other piece of the story that is a little weird, and it turns out that it did seem that Kayla and Todd did have a relationship before he kidnapped her. So she, as I said, that she had been working for Todd um, right. before, but they mm-hmm. did have a sexual relationship before. There is... Um, gross. He's gross. Yes. He is. <laughs> Um, there is in their Facebook messages, there's one interaction Mm -hmm. that goes, Kayla, I'm available Wednesday night. Also, he'll be leaving for work around six 30 on Wednesday. And Todd goes, would love to see you. And not just for a quickie. And Kayla goes, I would be all yours. Just let me know. Also during the initial conversation with Todd, while they were searching his property, the police already knew about this relationship and i guess they found this out when they went into their facebook accounts after the weird facebook shit um and so they ask him about it they tell him we know about your relationship with kayla we know that she's a stripper and that sometimes she gives you sex and you give her money and todd admits and agrees to this now none of this information seemed to get out to the media after the fact todd said that they had a sexual relationship for about a year And initially, it seemed that Kayla was saying that she met Todd through a friend on Facebook, and occasionally he would offer her work, and that was it. That was the story on the Dr. Phil show and everywhere, but it didn't seem to jive with what the police seemed to already know as evidence in the video footage of Todd's arrest. So it does seem that sometime in 2017, Kayla posted a video, I think it was a live video to Facebook, admitting to all of this. She... Did it under an alias, but then admit, but then said, like, it's me, Kayla Brown. And she says that, yes, she worked in a strip club called the uh, the Trophy Club in Greenville, South Carolina, from age 21 to 23, Mm -hmm. and that she would take Todd there. So they did have this relationship, which is a little interesting to know after the fact, but I also don't think changes anything about the case. Um, Yeah. So to me, the way well, he I still take- kidnapped her and held her hostage. So yes, if anything, to me, it shows that like he probably really liked her and she wasn't super into him. Then she started dating Charles and he's like, fuck that. And that's why he wanted to kill Charles. And that's why he invited her out and told her, bring anyone you want, knowing that she would bring Charles and that he could kill her in front of her. And then that would make her a better victim to him he hoped that he she would get Stockholm syndrome and like want to stay with him forever. And I think this is like, you know, I kind of debated putting this in or not, but I, I just think that for the most part, you know, everyone agrees that she is a victim. I don't think anybody's out there being like, well, she had a sexual relationship with him. Like th- therefore, like she's lying about everything. Like he clearly had her, like there's video evidence of her being locked up in a storage container. And I think I also understand why she wouldn't want to like give this information up, especially when it wasn't being talked about already. I think she probably like just didn't want to admit that she was a stripper in her early twenties for whatever reason, Um, yeah, which, you know, I think it's a really unfortunate thing when you are the victim of such like a horrible crime, the nature of like going through a trial, which she didn't really have to go to, but she did, um, hold on. 
she did um madison sorry. can you still hear me hold on the internet connection is okay i see you I think it cut out yeah i'm gonna take it back a little bit because that you want to take it back yeah because i i think that um it might still keep it on your end recorded but we should probably just read just in case yeah yeah i think I, i'm gonna take it back uh a little chunk um just in case I don't really know where to start from. Let me think about this for a second. Okay. Just talk to me for a second. I want to make sure I can see you clearly. Okay. Talking. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So I think it's still, despite all this information, I think it's still well-established and I think most people agree Kayla is purely a victim and the fact that they had this prior relationship doesn't really change any of the facts of the case or what he did to her. I think it explains maybe why he did it to her and why, um, like why he had an interest in her and he was, excuse me, probably jealous of her new relationship with Charles. It was a very new relationship and that explains why he told her bring anybody you want to come do this job knowing that she would bring Charles and knowing that he could then kill Charles in front of her. And then that, and he admitted like it, it will make her a better victim as he, we know that he was trying to give her Stockholm syndrome and keep her forever. According to her, although they did, there was like an empty grave outside the storage container that they found, like that he had ready for her. Oh my fucking God. We assume it was for her, but That's which so is scary. terrifying. But yeah. I think it's really, it's really possible that she just didn't want to like give up this information without needing to, if nobody was asking her like, Hey, were you a stripper before? That's like, fair. like, you know, there's many reasons why, like, maybe she just didn't want that information going out to the public. Yeah, I'm, a lot of people will judge you for that. It makes yeah. sense. And it's unclear whether or not her family knew about that. Or like, maybe, she, she, yeah, maybe she her might family just, just think wasn't people aware. would judge her. Absolutely. Yeah. And they probably would. Um, it, I think it's yeah. a really unfortunate thing that, and a reason why a lot of people don't um, talk about, like, being sexually assaulted or raped or whatever. It's like, exactly. if even if you're just the victim of a crime, like your entire life and all your personal business is going to get dragged through the court of public opinion for everybody to hear. Um, It's shitty. Um, Yeah. But it is like, it is a kind of relevant piece of information because it makes sense as to like, uh, it it makes sense about his behavior towards her. He clearly, I think he just like had a huge crush on her and like every other instance in his life, he didn't know how to just be like, Hey, I like you. Like, yeah whatever he had to he had to be like oh well like i'll just take her so fucked up you know which is like exactly what he did when he was 15 and he raped that girl hey squish right so cute bro you enjoying the podcast so far yeah it's great go 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 it's it's great (laughs) his head is so big i know um but yeah so and i think um, there was no trial. So like this didn't come out in a trial, but she did end up like suing him or whatever, mm-hmm. a civil lawsuit or whatever, and ended up receiving $6.3 million from his estate, which I he think has is that much money. Uh, yeah. I, How does he have that much money? He, he did. He was doing very well. I, As, uh, I guess fucked up people can be successful. Absolutely. I think being like yeah. kind of psychopathic make, like helps you be successful in certain Yeah, in some ways. That's true. You know? Well, good for her. Yeah. For getting it, that um, compensation. I think sometimes too, like you could sue people for as much money as you want and doesn't, and like they can award it to you, but if they don't have it, it doesn't mean you get it, you know? Right. I don't know if that was the case here, but she successfully did that. Mm-hmm. Um. A psychiatrist who spoke at the trial said that she had been treating Kayla extensively and that Kayla will likely need treatment and medication for the rest of her life as a direct result of what Todd did to her, which that's so sad. Sucks. Yeah. Now, okay, here's another very interesting thing that kind of throws a wrench in this whole thing. Okay. So 
So as I told you before, Charles was married to a woman named Nikki before he got with Kayla and they were separated, but they were not divorced at the time. Right. So there's some very weird, suspicious things that Nikki did through the investigation and before. So for one thing, remember how I told you that the apartment manager of the building had like gone into and found Kayla's dog. And that's how they found out that that's how they suspected she was missing, whatever. Well, the same apartment manager also came into the apartment and she caught Nikki leaving with Charles's computer. Okay. So after they went missing and before all the Facebook messages started coming about, she was caught taking his computer on August 31st, which unknown to everybody else at the time was the day that Charles was killed. Uh Nikki posted this as her Facebook status quote, rest in peace, my beloved husband. I'll see you again one day, dot, 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 end quote. On the day that he happened to be killed, that everybody, nobody knew he was killed. That could only mean one thing. That she was aware, right? Yeah. And why would she post that? She does not seem like the smartest woman. I will say this. I mean. Clearly. Um, next, Nikki <sighs> called Charles's cell phone provider to try to get his call records. Mm-hmm. When she did this, she said that she was a police officer. For this, she was charged for impersonating a police officer. She was ordered to pay $2,000 in restitution, and she was put on probation. So Charles's family is all very suspicious of Nikki for these reasons. But there's nothing solid linking her to the crimes. And when asked about Nikki, Todd claimed that she had nothing to do with it. But what the fuck? Yeah, how would she know that he was dead that day? And like she, you know, claims she didn't know, but like what, like what the fuck? That's yeah, so that weird. Is weird. Like, do they think that she was the one sending those messages? Well, that's the implication because she took the computer. Yeah. And like, I guess it would have like Todd would have had to, if he was the one sending the messages, it had to have been like a phone or something, but there's nothing was ever said about Charles's phone. Yeah. Cause I'm wondering like, was it one of those things where he took their phone or was it something where like he got their login information, which would be a whole other step. Yeah, it could be that. Because most of the messages were coming from Charles's account, which would make sense that it was Nikki. But then yeah, he, Todd is like, no, she didn't do it. Yeah, that's so weird. Maybe which, just independently, Nikki was doing all the Facebook stuff. It's possible. And Todd didn't even she, necessarily know about that. It's very possible. But they, then why? And also, why would she know that she could go take it and that they're not there, right? Exactly. Well, I yeah. Well, I think that she probably caught wind that they were missing. Okay, she already knew. But, like, why? Like, I get that you're probably mad. Like, I'm sure that they have a bad relationship. Clearly, like, whatever. Maybe she didn't want to end the relationship. But why is... Yeah. It's just such a weird thing to do. And it it's even more suspicious that she was trying to get his phone records and like impersonated a police officer, which yeah, is an why? actual crime. But this is just like something that's brought up in the documentary. And then it's Damn. just like, oh, that's weird. Yeah, that is fucking weird. Okay. I'll say. And so now I will tell you why he is called the Amazon review killer. Okay. I've been waiting for <laughs> Finally, this, this is the end. So- He received the name Amazon Review Killer, and this is why. So clearly Todd was, like, super into Amazon. He, like, mentions Amazon all the time, and there's parts of certain interrogation videos where he's, like, basically he's complaining that, like, Kayla is making him get all this stuff on Amazon, and, like, he's, (laughs) like, extra locks and stuff to, like, keep her alive and, like, buckets, whatever. But after the arrest, they were searching his computer, and I – I guess they discovered his Amazon Prime account, which he used to buy all the stuff for the property. Mm-hmm. And he left the most bizarre reviews under the name me. Like that was his Amazon name. Me. So, yeah. So I'll show the reviews um, here, but I'll just tell you about them. So this is one for a padlock, which reads, quote, solid locks have five on a shipping container. Won't stop them but sure will slow them down till they're too old to care, 
five stars. End quote. Okay. Here's another one for a knife. This one, he only gave four stars. Quote, haven't stabbed anyone yet. Dot, 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 what? Dot. Yet. Dot, 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 dot. But I'm keeping the dream alive. And when I do, it will be with a quality tool like this. Dot, dot, dot. End quote. Okay. Okay. This one is probably the funniest one. That's, that's a good one. That knife one is a good one. This one is for like a mini shovel. Okay. okay. So the, and he gave it five stars. Quote. Keep in car for when you have to hide bodies and you left the full size shovel at home. Dot dot dot. Does not come with a midget, which would have been nice. End quote. Oh, fuck. So like he's got a bunch of re- reviews for shit like this. That clearly like there's padlocks that he it says that he uses on the shipping container. He's brain, like he literally does hide bodies. Yeah, that's fucked. So it's just like really freaky and off-putting because i'm sure so many people read these reviews and were like what the fuck whatever but it's like no that's a serial killer literally leaving reviews on his serial killing tools and so that is why he's called the amazon review killer what is it with these murderers and leaving reviews for stuff i know right like adam strong the porn yeah disgusting yeah i don't i i don't know I think they just love like an audience. Yeah, definitely. This guy and, which, didn't get attention from his dad growing up and his mom enabled him um, into not having any empathy for anyone else and just being like a total loose cannon of emotion. So, but like, and these seeing these reviews, like to me really tracks with him being the one to like post all the Facebook stuff because it's the right. exact same type of thing where he's just like saying weird shit and then like everyone's commenting and he's like sweet like like just for the attention of it partially yeah. to brag about how cool and tough he is partially to try and endear himself to others and then partially just to get attention yeah which he, I think sums him up <laughs> he clearly loves attention which is yeah. why he wouldn't want the death penalty because like people are anybody still who talking doesn't about him. get it growing up usually they get like that's yeah and i think that was probably todd's biggest thing as, as a child he did not get attention yeah. he claims that he got zero attention from his father his father claims he gave him all the attention in the world uh, i i kind of feel like todd was more accurate in that description yeah. although often i don't think he is accurate and i think his mom case, ha- yes. had her own problems and didn't probably didn't really pay attention to him and was also probably actually scared of him for sure so it all tracks and like the mom as i like i talked about her before but like there's she's been on a lot of like she's talked to the media a lot since this all happened and i just think she's the saddest woman like she tried like she she clearly just tries to like she tries to be like i'm sorry to all the victims or whatever but like also she really tries to like make him seem like a person and like avoid saying that he's a serial killer um and like she's clearly just like really she's really sad like she's always crying yeah. and it's probably obvious to her that like yeah like you had a hand in this lady uh, for sure um and it's her only child yeah I mean, he's a fucking creepy serial killer oh that's and that. one <laughs> yeah yeah so that's the story of todd Culhep, and there's a lot of unanswered questions there i wonder if we'll ever find out answers to them i think there's people actively looking but i think it will mostly depend on what he's willing to talk about right i just want to know what happened to the feet i know that's just all i want to know well, there's if we ever make merch and somebody figures out what happens to the feet, we'll give you a free sweater or whatever we get. Yep. It's something we'd like to do in the future. I think we'd make some pretty cool merch. So let us know. Maybe, maybe Todd will call in and like give us the answer to get a sweater. Would you send him a sweater? If he told us, why not? Yeah, that's that seems like a fair trade. Mm. Do you think he can use the internet? Like, can he watch this? Um, I don't know. I don't know if I think it's it's situational whether or not inmates can use the computer. Like they yeah. they take classes and stuff if they want. So I think there have been inmates who are able to use the internet, or like people can 
other people could listen and then tell him. I, I really don't think this is going to get back to Todd Colehead, but like, who knows? You never know. Maybe he really wants a who's knocking sweater. Yeah, I would. Same. So, yeah. That's pretty interesting. I definitely think that he's more of like, it's kind of like you can see the progression in his life kind of makes sense why he ended up the way that he is. I am yeah, really it was know. a super clear trajectory, especially yeah. because um, like he got out of prison and like the um, sex offender thing, like just did not impede him Didn't from doing slow anything, him down, yeah. which to me yeah. is such an issue. It a hundred percent is. I mean, how many violent criminals get released into society, right? It's just like, and it's, you know, it's because should we, should we be checking up on these people? Yes. And how yeah. do people, how do they not, how I just can't get over that woman who was like, yo, your level three, most likely to offend sex offender is a real estate agent. Like, should that not be a giant red flag for the sex offenders registry office? You he should think. not be going into people's homes, getting keys for people's homes, seeing yeah. people one-on-one in their homes. That's ridiculous. So I think that's pretty horrible. Jeffrey Epstein's a level three, I think, too. No, I don't know. I think he might be. Well, he is or was either dead or dead. somewhere. On his island. Yeah. yeah. Let us know if you want that episode. Yeah, please set us up. And, you know, do all the things. Email us if you want. Hello at who's knocking podcast.com. Yep. We're most mostly active on Instagram. That's like our mm-hmm. our go-to which is at Who's Knocking Podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a Facebook now. It's kind of random. I don't know if people still go on Facebook, but we post there. We're on there. We're on the We're YouTube. On YouTube. The tube. Um, you can see us. We are doing virtual stuff right now because COVID is getting out of control where we live again so we're doing that um hopefully right we'll side get- is i do bring my dogs on the call so yeah. if you watch this on youtube you will see my dogs yeah just say um hopefully we will get back in studio soon yeah aka aiden's apartment um yeah. but we'll see so please reach out please give us a rating somewhere that would be really nice and just you know watch out because you never know Who's knocking? This podcast is produced in collaboration with Lost Line Media. Artwork by August Digital. Music by Matthew Cook.